Battling for control of western Iraq, the government takes on a resurgent al-Qaeda. It's a fight testing local loyalties and challenging a group bolstered by cross-border ties with Syria. This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Dedi in Abu Ghaida. Well, fighters united under the banner of Al Qaeda have taken control of a strategic city in western Iraq. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, known as ISIL, is also claiming victory in a series of battles in the province of Anbar. It's the latest challenge facing Prime Minister Nouri al Maliki, whose Shia led government has been accused by some Sunni Arabs of discrimination and marginalization. Well, senior police officials say the city of Fallujah is completely under the control of ISIL. There's also been heavy fighting in Ramadi and al Karma, both Sunni strongholds in the western province that borders Syria. Well, fighters from the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant are reported to have stormed police stations, seizing weapons and freeing prisoners, as well as setting buildings on fire. And fighting has been going on for almost a week. Well, Iraqi government forces have been accused of failing to get a grip on security since American troops pulled out two years ago. 2013 has been the deadliest in Iraq since 2008. Iraq's Sunnis in particular have become increasingly disenchanted. While some tribal militias are fighting alongside security forces, others are battling against the government. But speaking in a televised address, the prime minister presented a united front. The people of Anbar province are now standing shoulder to shoulder with the Iraqi armed forces. This is the true stance of Iraqis. They are once again carrying weapons to chase al-Qaeda members. This is the real attitude of the Iraqis. There will be no retreat until we eliminate the al-Qaeda members and rid the people of Anbar of their evil acts. Let's uh, bring in our guests. In Washington, D.C., we have Mark Kimmitz. He's a retired brigadier general in the U.S. Army and former military spokesman for coalition forces during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And joining us uh, via Skype from Baghdad is Muwaffaq al He's a former Iraqi national security advisor and an aide to the Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. And in London, we have Salah al-Hashimi, who's a legal advisor to the Iraqi League. That's a UK-based uh, rights group. Thanks very much for being with us on Inside Story. Muwaffaq al-Rabai, where has it gone uh, all terribly wrong? Why is ISIL now in control of uh, parts of the west of the country? Uh, I think the reason is multifactorial. Uh, number one is the Syrian uh, uh, civil war. And uh, number two is some of the tribal sheikhs uh, uh, in the western prov provinces got it wrong. They thought that uh, that uh, this is, a, this is a, a government and federal government is against them. Now they realized, I'm very pleased to say, that the, these uh, tribal sheikhs have realized that uh, uh, they, they were wrong and they are siding with the government and they're fighting with the government. They're when fighting. you say uh, these tribal yeah. sheikhs uh, got it wrong, can you clarify that position? Well, the, uh, the earlier, a couple of weeks ago, you ha we heard that uh, some of these uh, tribal uh, sheikhs have called for the army to withdraw from the uh, from Alambar province. Now they are calling the local government in Alambar, the elected local government in Alambar, as well as the tribal sheikhs, both are calling for the Iraqi army to come back to uh, clean the, the, their Al-Anbar uh, Al cities. And I believe the, it's, it's very good for uh, the Al-Qaeda is taking part of control of part of, uh, of Al-Fallujah. Now, Fallujah is going to be like uh, an abscess collecting pus from all over uh, Iraq, a magnet for the jihadists, for the terrorists to come all over there, and then that abscess has to be launched sometime. And I believe the Iraqi security forces are on the uh, on uh, on this on this on this job, and we are going to work. All right, uh, Mark, do you agree with what uh, Muwaffaq al rabai is telling us on the reasons that he believes ISIL is now in control of certain parts of the West? Well, I really do. I think that most of the world's press seems to have this wrong. They seem to portray this as a fight of the Sunnis and Anbar against 
the Shia-led government in Baghdad. But in fact, Abu Risha, the brother, the older brother of Abu Risha al-Sattar, who started the awakening movement in 2006, has, as the leader of his tribe and other tribes, are aligning themselves with the central government again to fight jointly against al-Qaeda. There may be some challenges in reconciliation between the Sunnis and Anbar in the central government, uh, but that's a low-level political matter that needs to be worked out in the long run. The near-term existential threat to Iraq, and in particular to the Sunnis and Anbar, is the presence of al-Qaeda. They have lived under al-Qaeda domination in the 2005-2006 period. They understand how dreadful that can be and how deadly that can be. And as Muafik said, and I agree with completely, uh, the prime minister has reached out to the Ambaris. The Ambaris have reached back to him and said, let's fight this common enemy together. We'll speak about uh, the fight of, as you call it, the common enemy together uh, in just a moment. But first, uh, Salah, over to you. Is it uh, much more of a complex situation, as Mark is saying, than uh, Sunni versus Shia? Far more complex than I heard. I wish your guest, Muafak al rawai was more accurate in his, in his presentation of the conflict. Uh, we must understand that there are two groups of tribes. There are tribes who have taken positions within government and have benefited from that government, and therefore it is in their interest to call on the government to send the army in order to crush their own opponents. And there are the other tribes who are in opposition to the government, who have taken up arms to face the army of uh, the Iraqi army, which was sent initially, of course, to fight al-Qaeda, which is basically um, located hundreds of miles away from uh, al-Ramadi and al-Fallujah in the desert of, of, of al-Ambar, which is a huge, big province. What has happened here is uh, that um, uh, uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki used the oldest trick in the book. He went over to America and said, um, please help me with weapons and whatever I need in order to fight terrorism. And when the Americans responded, he went back and initially um, flew a few planes over the deserts of al-Ambar, firing a few missiles uh, at some targets. I don't know what they are, but he said that they were al-Qaeda, which of course would have been welcomed by both the people of Fallujah and the because they know what al-Qaeda is. What happened afterwards was very controversial because then he went and arrested um, or tried to arrest the brother of um, uh, uh, an MP and arrested, ended up killing him and basically arresting the MP and also attacking the peaceful demonstrators, removing their tents, finding absolutely nothing there as, as he removed them and in the process turning the tribes of al-Ambar against him. Now, uh, I think the situation now is very critical because if we are to suggest that the Al-Anbar province are actually allying themselves with Al-Qaeda, this is a huge big mistake because they're not. Um, the, both the tribal, the tribal leaders and the religious leaders have issued a decree that nobody, nobody should burn any bill I'm sorry, should burn any buildings, should attack any police stations, nor attack any police personnel. So whoever is doing this is outside the tribes of Al-Ambar. This should be made absolutely clear. Their announcement and their declaration is quite public. So it is far more complex than it's being portrayed. Muwaffaq? Uh, I, I disagree with that, certainly. And I'll, I, I don't think Iraqis should uh, try to settle scores with the federal government now, what we have now, we have, as the gentleman said, we have a critical situation. We are in, a, a, in, a, in, a, in an excess, existential uh, uh, st status here. We need to unite behind our in Iraqi security forces, behind our security forces, and all of us, all Iraqis, from all parliamentary blocs, political parties, communities, community leaders, Sunni, Shia, all unite should be united behind our security forces to right, win but this that begs, fight. That begs the but, question, but, Muafak, I apologize for interrupting it, you, but you it, say it, they should, but how united are they? Yeah, well, we, we, we may differ with the prime minister. We may differ with the, with the, with the we may have a, our own criticism to the federal government, but uh, we, may, we may criticize its economic, political policies and so on and so forth, but that is not the time to do it. Let's forget, the, let's put this on the side and win this fight, and then we will talk about this. Now, this number two is very, it's very important, I believe. And what Mark uh, has, uh, General Kemet has, has referred to is this. 
we need to have a, a comprehensive measures of real national reconciliation after this this fight and we need to have all the sunni whether they are disfranchised disenchanted margin feel marginalized feel uh, unjust we need to include them in the federal government we need to give them uh, their real partner in 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 this in this country and i believe we we are, we have a huge job ahead of us after this battle but let us finish this battle and win over al qaeda and there is no anyone who is who is showing or uh, raising an arm against the government of iraq against the iraqi security forces is is considered terrorist uh, until I... last, he's uh, side he's siding with the with the security forces to expel al qaeda Mark Kimmett, speaking of the impending battle, and Muwafaq is referring to it uh, right now, the government in Iraq is preparing what a senior official has described as a major attack to uh, retake uh, Fallujah and fight the ISIL. And the prime minister, as we've been reporting, is saying that there is an agreement and cooperation between the army and the tribesmen. How much cooperation is there from your experience? And can the army take control of uh, Fallujah alone without the tribes? Uh, on the second question, no, I don't think that the army is capable of taking Fallujah and Ramadi back by its own uh, capabilities. What the, what the military is going to bring, they will bring tanks, artillery, personnel. But the key battle, the key element that is necessary is intelligence. And without the support of the tribes to provide that intelligence, that neighborhood intelligence, that local intelligence, uh, it, it will not be successful. That's why it's so important for both sides to work together on this. I frankly don't see that significant of a difference between what Mr. Al Hashimi and what Muafik are both saying. The key element right now is to defeat Al Qaeda. There is a longer term issue in terms of ensuring political reconciliation, which has so far eluded uh, the central government and the Anbaris. But this is a tactic of Al Qaeda that people must understand. Al Qaeda finds itself sanctuary and safe haven in areas that are not necessarily under complete control. They come in like a cancer, they come in like an infection. As Muwafik said, the first thing that needs to happen is that Al Qaeda must be defeated and ejected from the Western provinces. And as Mr. Al Hashmi said, that must be done with the support of the tribes, not as an isolated uh, single operation done only by the Iraqi security forces. Uh, Salah, I'll come over to you because I saw you nodding along to uh, what Mark was saying. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, with what Mr. Kimmett has just said in that it is an intelligence-led battle. It is not a battle to be fought by weapons uh, such as uh, tanks and Humvees and, and, and planes. Um, uh, what is happening is this. It's a very dangerous issue. The government forces, as I understand it, and I've read reports this morning, they are surrounding both Fallujah and Ramadi, cutting off all the supplies from the residents of both towns. This is not going to strengthen the tribe who are against al-Qaeda wholeheartedly, it is going to instead weaken them. So instead of saying, well, we are going to fight al-Qaeda and we are going to defeat them, you are actually weakening the real enemy of al-Qaeda, those who have a track record of defeating them in the past, as Mark would know, and they are the Ambar tribes. You don't treat them by surrounding them and cutting off their supplies. You actually befriend them and first and foremost release the MP that you have arrested, initiate a committee to investigate what happened on that fateful night where he where he was arrested and his brother was murdered and lastly and not least you must meet the demands of the demonstrators I think I think the international community is committing a huge big crime by being silent what is happening now is and and, and unfortunately I say this is the crime of collective punishment because you tell me and I think Mark would be most suited to answer this question how would shelling the outskirts of Fallujah mainly residents who have absolutely nothing to do with the fighters, they're just families living in their own homes, is going to benefit the fight, of, uh, the fight against Al-Qaeda. Okay, let's put that Number to Mark. Two, uh... No, I, I, I completely agree that, that the, both the tribes and the central government, the Iraqi security forces, have to work collectively and as a joint operation. If, if either side doesn't trust the other side, this won't work. 
the central government, the Iraqi security forces can bring the guns and the tanks. The tribes can bring the intelligence, the local knowledge, and the allegiance. And they have to be brought together as a single effort working together, the way that the American forces were absolutely unsuccessful in Ramadi and Fallujah in 2007, until the Sawa, until the awakening, brought the two of them together in the collective effort to it, to rid themselves of Al Qaeda. Mark, so the government just, needs to right. be very discriminatory on how it how it operates in that region. I think you've just answered, in fact, my next question. But let me cross over to Muwaffaq. And speaking of the Sahwa, uh, what's known as the awakening, that happened in 2006. Just to our, for our viewers to know, that's when uh, Sunni tribesmen joined forces with U.S. troops and fought Al Qaeda. There's talk now, Muwaffaq, of the Sahwa uh, being reawakened and reinstating these uh, tribes in these groups. Can you tell us what the situation is now? Uh, we have had uh, Sahwa 2006 and 7 and 8. We have tried this. It was successful. It was tried and tested and it was successful. And uh, the intelligence led war the gentleman referred to it's, is absolutely right. The source of human intelligence is extremely important for this fight. And the, the source for this mm -hmm. is the tribal, tribal sheikhs. So I, I honestly believe. In, in the in the in the trend the general trend of the discussion that we need we need a lot of intelligence from the tribe we need the, a lot of their uh, sons and 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 young men to to go back and do the sahwa and do the training and be integrated with the Iraqi security but forces but does the government have the support from the sunnis to to uh, restart uh, reintegrate the sahwas well i i think the bridges for trust and confidence need to be rebuilt now. Uh, we, we have a treatment of choice, which we have tried and tested and was successful in 2006 and 7 when, when, when the Americans were, were around. Now, I think we need to retry the same treatment, the same measures which we have tried before, and it was successful. So I can't see any problem in this. Well, we touched upon the international community just a few minutes ago. Let me tell you what the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, has said on the situation in Fallujah and in the west of Iraq. He said that America will stick by Iraq, but he ruled out sending back any troops. He called the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant the most dangerous players in the region and said, we will stand with the government of Iraq and with others who will push back against their efforts to destabilize. We're going to do everything that's possible, but added, I will not go into the details. Mark Kimmett, what details is he referring to here? Well, I think what he's referring to is the fact that the United States is providing a package of assistance to the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi government. Look, uh, I don't think anybody wants to send American troops back into Iraq. Hoshar Zabari, the foreign minister, when I asked him this question, when he was in Washington, D.C. recently, he said, Mark, listen, we've got a million men under arms. We don't need your troops. What we need is your capabilities. What we need are your intelligence capabilities, some of your advanced weapon systems. And the United States recently announced through the New York Times article of the 25th of December that they're providing Hellfire missiles, some Scan Eagle drones, capabilities to facilitate the effort between the Anbari tribes and the Iraqi security forces, but certainly not contemplating sending American troops back in. Uh, Salah, your comments? Well, first of all, well, first of all, let me comment on Al-Sahwa. Al-Sahwa was um, um, something that was established by the Americans, and it was successful because they were well maintained. What Al-Maliki did was actually to strangle them because he cut off funding. He, 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 he disagreed with the promises that he made to them by including them with it within the security services, and therefore they are naturally not going to ally themselves to him. Uh, I think, um, and I slightly disagree with, uh, with Muwafaq al in that they need to be reignited. Um, I think the, the trust element, which was very important in establishing al-Sahwa, has now been lost, and therefore this government needs to change before al-Sahwa can be reignited because of that trust element. Now, the other issue is, um, 
the tribes have called the government in order to assist them to rid themselves of any elements of Al-Qaeda. Now, what the government had said, no, Al-Qaeda emerged within the demonstrators. Now, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, incumbent upon the government to allow at least the local forces, i.e. the police, in order to clean or to rid themselves from these uh, supposed elements that have emerged within Al-Anbar province. Right, it but just back to my question, Salah, for, for, for the benefit of time, back to my question of what Mark was saying to uh, saying that Iraq does not not need American boots on the ground. What do you think? That is absolutely true. It, it, it doesn't. If if the trust is established between the tribes and 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 the security forces, what Muwaffaq al rubai is saying is partially correct. We need to be we need to have as a country strong and effective security forces in order to fight external and internal threats. But this is not to say that these security forces are abandoned completely from any oversight, whereby they commit crimes against the people and they are not held any accountable. I'll give you an example. There's a double standard in operation within these security forces. Let us take the arrest and the murder of the MP as a case in point. And equally, we have had recently news of the arrest of someone called Wathiq al-Battat, who is the leader of an armed militia within Iraq. Now, when that person was arrested, we have absolutely no evidence of his arrest. We have absolutely no evidence of any confessions. We have no pictures as emerged of the arrest of the MP and his brother. We have absolutely no evidence as to what the government intend to do with him when he has self-confessed that he has committed crimes within Iraq. Now, this is the type of double standards that makes people slightly angry at the government. Well, and it's a very complex think, situation, right? It's a very complex situation. But just back to the <clears> ISIL <throat> uh, for just a moment, gentlemen. It's made up of a variety of groups, as you very well know, and clans of Sunni faith. It has its origins in an insurgent movement which rose to prominence after the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. It became known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq a year later after pledging its allegiance to the group. It aimed to establish a single state based on Sharia or Islamic law in Sunni dominated regions of Iraq and this was later expanded to Syria and the name amended to its current title. The ISIL is one of the strongest rebel units fighting government forces in Syria but it's facing opposition from an alliance of other rebel groups which brings me to my ne que next question. Muwaffaq al-Rabai and when you look at the, uh, the, st the strength of the group in Syria how much um, can you just give us uh, tell us how linked the situation is between Iraq and Syria when it comes to the ISIL well uh, we could we with the some people consider some good analysts intelligent analysts consider this is a uh, one fight uh, this is one civil war uh, we don't uh, we think we think that uh, we are strengthening our uh, borders with Syria, the port of entries as well, are very strengthened and the other extra capabilities we are putting in in this uh, port of entries. Uh, a lot of troops also as well on the on the borders. So uh, the uh, ISIL uh, the in, in, in Iraq probably were talking about several thousand, not more than that. Uh, I, I think we I wanted to go to back to the very important points which you raised which is the role of the international community. Very uh, briefly, this, because I do want to discuss Syria. The U.S. Uh, you, US should not send, and we will not need, and we will not ask the U.S. to send the boots on the ground. Mark now, Kimmett, how important is the Syrian connection when it comes to what's going on in Iraq and in the west of Iraq and the ISIL? Yeah, first of all, you need to understand this is not new. I sat down with Bashar al-Assad along with Peter Rodman and Secretary Burns in 2005, warning him that his use of Damascus Airport as a way station for al-Qaeda to flow into Western Iraq, to kill American soldiers, to kill Iraqi citizens, was one day going to come back and bite him. Uh, he was very dismissive of that point, but what he has allowed is an al-Qaeda insurgency to develop both in the north of Syria and the west of Iraq that I think we're starting to see the fruits of that uh, decision made by Bashar al-Assad back in 2003-2004. They are connected, they do get support from each other, and uh, there needs to be as much work done by the international community on the Syrian situation as is being suggested here to help in the Iraqi situation. 
All right, thank you very much. That's General Brigadier Mark Kimmet. We have Muwaffaq al Rubai as well as Salah al Hashmi. Thanks very much for joining us on Inside Story. And uh, thank you to our viewers for watching. You can always find this program and many others at aljazeera.com. You follow the links for shows and Inside Story. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. Thanks for watching. And from me and the whole team, goodbye for now.